Hi there, I'm David Harvey, and I'm here with John Andrews, and this is the Two Techs Podcast. In this podcast, we're two friends in two different countries, here with you every two weeks talking about two different texts from the Bible. In this season, as we enter our second year of podcasting together, we step beyond the stories of Jesus in the Gospels and into the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts is a series of stories and events from the early church when they encounter the disrupting presence of the Holy Spirit. Well, hello, John. (laughs) How are you today? Well, I'm, I'm glad to be talking to you. We've had some challenging technical problems this week because I'm on the road. and You're uh, traveling, aren't you? <laughs> I am traveling. I am traveling. I'm just at the end of two weeks on the road where I've been doing lots of stuff. So currently in the Bible College of Wales in Swansea, just finished a week of teaching with a gorgeous bunch of students here. It's a sort of an intensive discipleship program. And we've just done a little bit of teaching around Luke 252. So that's just been great this week. Excellent. So two texts across the Atlantic and on the road, but it's just great to be able to talk to you. And we're in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32 to 37 in this episode. We're mm-hmm. going to chat a little bit about actually quite a lot of things that are said in what what almost functions as a bit of a summary statement to the preceding couple of stories. You've had this run from Acts chapter 3 to Acts chapter 4 of all these things happening. And now Luke gives us a sort of little five verse window into life in the early church or the first church mm. might even be the right thing to say. Yeah. And so you're going to read it for us, John, and then and we'll dive in. Absolutely. I would be honored to. So here we go. And it says this, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There was no needy persons among them, For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money for the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet." So in the narrative, <laughs> it's a conclusion summary, but like some readers might jump ahead to, <laughs> to, to chapter five and realize that that final sentence both summarizes and pushes us forward into what's going to happen in this, in this in, like incredible story that we're only four chapters into so far. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Absolutely amazing. And, and of course, we reflected last time on in chapter four, this amazing experience that Peter and John have, then they go to this prayer meeting. And and I, I love this idea of Peter's prayer, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant. I, I love the positiveness of the prayer that this was yes. pointing to a community that wasn't set against something, but rather a community mm-hmm. that was set for something. And then I think that rolls beautifully into a a summary description of this community. Straight out of that, it says they were, and again, this is our gorgeous link to the Holy Spirit, this beautiful disrupting presence. Chapter 4, verse 31, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And then it goes straight in. All the believers Mm. were one in heart and mind. And you get this beautiful movement from a dynamically, what we might call a dynamic spiritual experience of the prayer meeting and this incredible response of God in the prayer meeting and a supernatural event. And then we're launched from there straight into community, practicality, Mm -hmm. and expression of that spirituality. And I love that, Mm -hmm. David. I, I love, again, the earthiness of that. They don't live in the prayer meeting. They don't stay in this holy presence. They don't want to to use the Peter illusion from years ago. They don't want to stay up the mountain of transfiguration. They they mm. actually come out of this prayer meeting and then we're told immediately this community 
ha, are one in heart and mind. And not only that, but that one in heart and mind is expressed in taking care of each other's needs. I, I love the connectedness of that. My Bible, unfortunately, mm-hmm. my translation splits verse 31 and 32 with a heading. Mm-hmm. And my heading says, the believers share their possessions. And actually, that little heading just just disturbs the flow yes. a little bit. And although, as you say, it does sit as a gorgeous little distinct summary section, I think it is it is meant to be understood in the flow of all this dynamic supernatural expression and expectation that goes before it. And, and that beautiful, beautiful cohesion and connectedness mm. between what is perceived as spiritual and what is perceived as material, even though we would see them as one and the same. I, I think that there's a way of reading Acts which says, Oh, Acts is just about how the Holy Spirit works. Mm. But like what I hear when you're saying that is, is that what Luke is guiding us through is all the levels of disruption of the Holy Spirit, right? So that essentially what you actually get is that here is how the Holy Spirit is. But there's also a level wherein Luke is also saying, and here is what it is to be human, right? So he's describing how the Holy Spirit works, but also describing how humans should work. There's an insight into the ideal of this community. And we have a tendency, I think, as, as humans to say, Oh no, what we are interested in Acts is how does the Holy Spirit work? Because we know how we work. Mm. But it seems like what Luke is showing, even in only four chapters, what he has showed us is, if you actually really lean into how the Holy Spirit works, you're going to have to change your mindsets and your attitudes towards how humans work. Because humans are going to have to act differently and behave differently as a result of God's working through the Holy Spirit. But if you live within the wider creation theology that we've talked about, which Mm. seems to be present in the New Testament. Mm. Of course, if the Holy Spirit is changing how we behave, he's probably changing us to how we're supposed to behave. Hence why I say there's there's actually a description of how to be properly human in all of this. Yeah, so good. And as as someone who's been raised in a a full-on Pentecostal setting, I would concur completely with that. I, I think as a boy, when I sat in church and heard sermons on on the book of acts it was always about what the holy spirit would do to us in us mm-hmm. through us but the the focus was always almost exclusively and i hope i'm not doing a disservice to my upbringing it was almost exclusively sort of i would describe as spiritually orientated it was it mm. was the holy spirit working in my spirit towards spiritual ends mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. And actually, I don't think we heard much translation into the human, and mm. apart from the experience of being filled with the Spirit and speaking in tongues and mm. laying our hands on the sick, etc., which are all, yes. of course, dynamically important. We 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 believe oh, that yes, those yes. things are important in the Book of Acts and to us. But but actually, here's a community expressing transformational behaviour toward each mm. other in the same breath that they've just had the most incredible prayer meeting and they've Mm. seen God at work and they've seen God do something truly incredible in them. Mm. And I love that, that that's seamless in the book of Acts. It doesn't, Mm. it doesn't feel like we're changing gear. It feels like this is just another expression of this amazing work of this amazing Holy Spirit in this new community that's called to follow Jesus. So I, I do think it's a, it's it's worth for our listeners to really track mm. that all the way through the book of Acts. Yeah, I think that when we distance ourselves from that way of thinking, then what happens is there's a tendency to see Acts 4.32 as, as just evidence of the new community rather than also to read that as a work of the Holy Spirit. Indeed. They were together, one in heart and in soul or heart and, and, and spirit or, or however you want to translate that. And... I mean, if any of us have ever been in a room with other people, we know how hard it is to be Mm. one in heart and soul or one Mm. in heart and mind. And, 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 but I I don't often see us read Acts 4.32 and say, oh, look, the Holy Spirit is still working. But as you just said, if you follow the run on of the sentence, the Holy Spirit is working powerfully amongst these group of people. And, and Luke says, if, if I can paraphrase, Luke says, and look, 
They were of one heart and soul. <laughs> and, yeah. and then you get this statement. Nobody claimed the the my translation here has it as private ownership of any possessions. Yeah. I yeah. love how the Greek the Greek puts it almost that nobody had an advantage yes. of stuff. So nobody was first in line is, is almost the, but yeah. instead of an attitude of, well, this is mine, so I get to go first. What they have is this, this notion of, of, of common comes in. And I just think we, and we can unpack those terms, but, but an overarching sense of this being the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then this fascinating lead on from that, because then verse 33 says, Indeed. with great power, the apostles gave Indeed. their testimony. And I just want to imagine, John, that, that, that when Luke's talking about with great power, they give testimony, that the testimony he has in mind is the work of the Holy Spirit in the speaking of boldness, but also the work of the Holy Spirit Spirit in bringing them into common with each other. I, yeah. I think they're all part of the testimony. Indeed. And, and a, a, a beautiful interchange in the whole way through. You start with the believers, uh, one heart and mind, then mm. the sort of commonality of possessions, then the statement with great power, the apostles continued to testify the resurrection of Jesus, and then mm. straight back into it. And there was no needy persons among them. Mm. It's yeah. it's like it's like you have the same intertwining repeated. It's it's like it's yes. it's a, an, a another emphasis of the same mm. idea. It's a repeat idea. We've just seen the power of God. The first thing we're told about is that power of God is demonstrated in this oneness, which expresses itself in possessional generosity. Then we mm. have another flip into power of God and the resurrection being declared, and then another expression of. There was no needy persons among them. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I love the way that is intertwined. And I, I love the fact that the Holy Spirit isn't just here to transform us in a dynamic, obviously supernatural way to bring the kingdom of God to our world through power and demonstration and signs and wonders and the proclamation of the good news of Jesus. But also, but also this is now literally changing the way people look at their world, the way people look at their finance, the way people look at themselves. This is this is changing the very behavior and fabric of the community in one mm. of the most, I think, powerful expressions of human community is when our money and material autonomy is impacted. Mm. So people love the idea of community uh, until we are challenged with areas that we deem autonomous. Mm. Actually, oh yeah, I'm happy to share a pew with you. I'm not going to share my money. I'm happy to share this service with you, but like I, I really don't want to I don't want to get into your world in terms of mm. the material challenge we're facing. Because yes. because for many, no, no, that's that's autonomous. That's that's mm. mine. But here's the Holy Spirit disrupting the autonomy yeah, of yeah. this community. At the very issue which strikes at the heart of so many. It's really it's really fascinating that the only thing that Jesus really compares as a rival to God is money, is mm. material things, mammon. And I think mammon, money, material things, is one of those big autonomy markers for humans. Mm. If we can demonstrate that we're self-sufficient, that we've got financial control, that we've got financial prosperity, that we've got some sort of even status socially because of financial cloud mm. that actually that that there's something that really panders to the ego of the human that can mm. remain autonomous because they're self-sufficient yeah. and here that autonomy is being challenged at both supply and need level it, it, does that make sense in, in terms of that dis- oh. again that disruption of the spirit uh, yeah d- deeply I, I deeply feel that the, the language of ownership is is so significant to us. I, I, I've, I've mentioned Willie Jennings' uh, mm. commentary a couple of times, which I found mm. very provocative uh, reading of Acts. Well, I actually had an opportunity to to go to hear him talk just uh, just before we were recording, actually. And 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 what you're saying just there just re- resonates with some stuff that he was saying in that lecture. If you think about world history, right? Mm. World history is powerful people 
moving around the world, claiming ownership of things, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there is like there is an American flag on the moon, right? Yeah. Like there's literally this small patch of the world made a rocket, flew to the moon, put a flag in it. And although they didn't say it as clearly as this, the flag sort of symbolizes, we kind of think this is ours now, right? So, you know what I mean? And, and when you think about the colonization programs of, of France and of Europe and of England and of, 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 of America, we go to other places and we yep. tell and we and we take over these places as ours and we tell these people how to behave in ways that we are comfortable with it's ownership but then you read the first four chapters of acts and what we've seen over our long conversation is we have i mean think think about this i'm getting carried away here john but, but just I, i'm so struck by this off the back of what you're saying the normal way of almost all religion is you move to a new place and you evangelize that place by saying here you need to learn these things about us so that we can tell you about this God. And including yep. in most religions, you need to learn the language of the religion so yep. that you can read the Holy Scriptures. And the beginning of the church is all of these other languages being spoken, right? Mm -hmm. And praises to God being heard. And, and we're repeating a little bit here when I say this, but I think it's important that the, the, the opening of the church, the, the Lord God says to his creation, I'm coming to you. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm coming to you in your language so that you mm -hmm. can hear about me in your own tongue. You don't need to learn your own language to come in. You don't need to learn my language so you can hear from yeah. me. And this is this whole picture of the only journey. We've spent all of the Old Testament trying to journey somewhere. And then the journey that actually matters is God to us. Right? Beautiful. Now, now what we find is the human tendency to want to claim ownership. You know, you and me are not claiming ownership of countries, but we have little patches of ground that we go, this is my house <laughs> on my bit of land. And, the, and what we see in the Holy Spirit is a God who doesn't overwhelm you, but also a God who doesn't come and take things from you, but actually encourages you to think yep. differently about things. And I think... I mean, I think Luke is doing some profoundly heavy lifting of some yep. huge, not just theological, but but yep. issues of worldview for us, showing us how yep. the Holy Spirit is changing things. Absolutely, absolutely, and of course, all of that, all of that conversation in Acts four is located in one of the most dominant world empires the world mm. ever seen. So there is a... An They're taking land off everybody. <laughs> absolutely. There is an incredible juxtaposition there that, that mm. if we constantly locate the Book of Acts in the zenith of the Roman Empire, I mean, this thing mm. is still rising. It yes. would be another 400 years before it collapses. And and yet there is a, there is a yeast in the dough here mm -hmm. that is offering mm -hmm. an alternative that's offering something dynamic and i i love the tension david and I, and I think the book of acts represents this i love the tension between freedom freedom of will which is the express mm -hmm. image of god in humans that's mm -hmm. this freedom to choose but but actually and you, you you hinted at it so beautifully there god is inviting us to express our freedom of will by releasing our autonomy Mm, mm. And, and humans, we love our autonomy. We, we love the idea that not only are we free to choose, but we are free to govern. And I think that's a deeper issue. So like, it's easy, like as a teacher, preacher, and even a follower of Jesus, it's easy to celebrate freedom of will, freedom mm -hmm. of choice. I mean, that's a no brainer. And we're all, we're all the, <laughs> but the, the challenging aspect of being a person of the way, and we're seeing it right here in the ordinary moments of sharing what they have is that now that freedom of will is being invited to surrender independence of governance that mm. that that my my freedom to choose is is invited by the lord to to surrender my ability to self-govern. And I, I mm. think that's very, very deeply power. I think that strikes at the heart of all serious faith journey that am I going and, and we, we, we sort of hinted at it in our reading with Barnabas. Barnabas chooses to sell a field. So this is not yes. under compulsion. He's not being muscled here to sell his field. He's being invited by the community, by the Holy Spirit to 
exercise his freedom of choice by surrendering his his ability to self-govern. Mm. And he liquidates an asset and gives it away. And and I think I think that's that's it's not just about doing good to the poor here. It is about what is my attitude to my own autonomy, my own ability to govern myself. And mm-hmm. one of the issues at the heart of that is is my financial, my physical, my material independence. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a theme we hear constantly. And it's a repeat theme already. We've only got to chapter four of the book of Acts and this theme's popped up <laughs> numerous yes. times. There's there's a there's a beautiful tension for us in almost an incarnational reading of all of this uh, at, at multiple levels. So we mm. talk about the incarnation, God becoming flesh. And of course, God's becoming flesh. And, and we struggle so often as humans to know well, how does that work, right? Is a bit of Jesus divine and a bit of Jesus human? And, mm. I, and I feel like we have to live within the paradox of that sometimes and also realize that God, that Jesus shows us how that works, right? Mm. By being Jesus. But the incarnation also models something to us. And I was thinking just as you were, as you've talked through several parts of this text, there's there's a blurriness between where is the divine of God ending in Jesus and where is the human of Jesus beginning, right? Yeah. And, and I think the best way to live with that is that you're, you, if you want fixed, clear categories, then you're never going to get them. But Jesus eating food and being thirsty, is that his human side or is that as much his divine side as Jesus raising the dead and, 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 and so on and so forth? In Acts 4.32, look, we've got a similar blurriness between spiritual stuff and practical stuff. Yep. All, the, the, the people of the incarnate Jesus... I think have to live with the fact that God blurs things for us, you know, yeah. that you can't say, oh, well, that's the spiritual bit and this is the practical bit. True. The spiritual is practical in the same way as you can't say that's the holy bit of Jesus, that's the human bit of Jesus. Jesus is both divine and human together. Mm. But then on top of that, I think this model of the incarnation, think about Philippians 2, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to yeah. be grasped at Beautiful. and held on to. Yeah. And now here we have in Acts 4.32, the people of the spirit of Jesus are yeah. not grasping after their advantage, right? And and now Luke's language doesn't isn't word for word the same as Philippians 2. But it's but did you hear what I'm, I'm scratching oh, at, John? This, sure. Jesus could have scratched after and grabbed after yeah. and held on to his equality and advantage with God. He didn't. And we see that the testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus in verse 33 is actually being lived out in them behaving like Jesus. Like someone had an advantage, someone had ownership, somebody had possessions, but they didn't hold on to it. Somehow the Mm. spirit of Jesus has caused these Christians to start behaving like Jesus. Does that make sense? Oh, beautiful. Just beautiful. I love that. That's absolutely superb. And that's well worth hunting in terms of that just gorgeous link that you made with our conversation of freedom and autonomy to Philippines mm. 2. Absolutely mm. correct. You know, in Jesus, you see someone who at one level is free and yet surrendering his freedom. The son can do nothing by himself, he said. Just mm. an amazing, mm. mind-bending statement from John 5. He can do only what he sees the father doing. What? I, I, mm. I, I have tracked that verse for like, and it still makes my brain melt because yes. I, 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 you, you, you've got here God in flesh who has surrendered something for a greater, a greater cause in himself. And that's essentially the essence of what we are seeing mm-hmm. here. And I do, I do absolutely agree that I, I think, and I am so grateful to the Lord for my upbringing. I'm so grateful for my for for, for my heritage. Mm. I really am. So please do not hear this the wrong way. But I definitely, my spirituality definitely suffered suffered by separating a spiritual realm from a mm. physical material realm, and yes. and that was a very strong separation that in the church that I grew up in, and and I mm. think consciously subconsciously i definitely was influenced by that i think i've come to a place of perhaps more robust 
insight and revelation and I would certainly say practice on that now. But that was definitely, definitely there. That somehow being filled with the Spirit was about mission. Being filled with the Spirit was about bringing supernatural to broken situations. But it was never about these sorts of conversations about ministering to the community in this way. So that was def I, I think that incarnational and that fusing of the two, where does one stop and the other start? I think it's a great analogy. And it's worth noting, even closer to home than Philippians 2, is actually verse 33 of our, with great power, the apostles gave testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I think it's mm. interesting you get that word resurrection in there because if you think about how the New Testament reflects on resurrection, resurrection is the spirit of God bringing Jesus back in his body. Right? Yep. So, so I think like Tom Wright's book, Surprised by Hope, is to me one of the best kind of readings on this out there. But if God is bringing back life to Jesus's body, yeah. then we can learn a lot about God. We can learn that God isn't just interested in the spiritual. God is interested in, if he's interested in the human body of Jesus, then yep. the, the actually the New Testament comes to the conclusion He's interested in all human bodies. Right? Yeah. Therefore, God is interested in his, maybe unsurprising, he is creator God. But, mm. but see, it's interesting that you've got, look at Acts 32, 33, 34, that, you know, the whole group, so as you said, it practical. The whole group claim, didn't claim ownership, had anything in common. Then you get this r testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. If we're not careful, yeah. we can think, oh, spiritual. Right? And then there was not a needy person amongst them back That's to practical it. again. Mm. But mm. there's this beautiful sense that the resurrection will always for us as Christians be the thing that convinces us that the spiritual and the practical are forever merged together. And, and, and the resurrection, if God didn't care about the practical, he could have just taken Jesus' spirit back to heaven and we all live happily ever after in heaven. Yeah. But, but God chooses to raise Jesus from the dead. I think mm. telling us that you know, needy people are an issue for the gospel. That yeah. that that claiming ownership to the to the exclusion of others is an issue for the gospel. The resurrection yeah. tells us that, yeah. and and I think I think it's beautiful the way Luke kind of almost holds them both together for us. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I I think that's a, a gorgeous reflection there, David, and and it it really there's a sense in which our spirituality is encompassing. I I love what Nelson says. He says everything that God touches becomes sacred. Now, I know you have to be careful with this. He, in context, he doesn't mean immorality is sacred or illegality is sacred. But what he means is, if we're making the journey to understand our spirituality is deeply integrated into every facet of our world, mm. then there's a sense in which what we allow the spirit, what we allow the word, what we allow the father to touch becomes a sacred expression of that surrender. And so then in this context, my money, my material ability, my wealth in, in certain cases then, and this for some of these believers, becomes a an expression of sacred. It mm -hmm. becomes an expression of the holy. It becomes an expression of the pure. And of course, the, the, these traditions are well well grounded even in the Torah mm -hmm. and and the, these are not surprising ideas but of course Luke is positioning these ideas as being empowered by the reality of the resurrection of Jesus and by the in, in, enduring presence and power of the Holy Spirit so so this this practice of community is is centered around now um you know, these these ideas and these truths and I think that is dynamically powerful as a thought well that's it for today thank you so much for listening and we hope that you enjoyed it if you want to get in touch with either of us about something we said you can reach out to us on podcast at two texts.com or by liking and following the two text podcast on Facebook Instagram and Twitter if you really did enjoy the episode, then we'd love it if you left a review or a comment where you're listening from. And if you really enjoyed this episode, why not share it with a friend? 
Don't forget that you can listen to all of our podcasts from this season and others at www.twotext.com. But that is it for now. So until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.